أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحتي والمجدد لمن مرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no part. And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles and on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the God, and on the Mujadda, the Reformer, which was all sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And now, the true light featuring Al Sayyid, Al Imam Isa, Al Hadi, Al Mahdi. And I also wanted you to explain um, 2 Timothy, the 3rd chapter. Tell me what you want to know. It's only fair. Because people will ask me off the top of their head. They'll say, explain 2 you know, Timothy. What are you trying to find out? Then I'll tell you what you want to know. 2 Timothy's what? 3rd chapter? What verse? Well, the whole chapter, it was given to me to read. So okay, first of all, let's establish this, okay? Timothy was not even a person that wrote the book. All right? Again, we're back to the same problem. The book of Timothy was written by Paul, the self-acclaimed apostle. You understand that? And Paul wrote this book in the year 65. Take down the notes for the person who told you this, okay? Now, let's find out what Paul says about his revelation before I go into the book. Turn your book to another one of his own books, which is the first book of Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 6. Remember, Timothy was written by Paul. 65 A.D. Let's see what he says about his own books. 7 verse 6, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. He says, that which he speaks is not by way of the commandments of the Most High, but only by permission. And that permission has to come through the law of Israel, which I'll show you. Also, if you turn to another book of his, 2 Corinthians, chapter 11 verse 17, and read it. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. <laughs> Paul says here that the words that he speaks are not coming from the Lord of hosts. They're not from the Heavenly Father. They're merely what? He speaks foolishly and folly. And his confidence of boasting. And his own confidence and his boastings. You follow what I'm saying? Now this is what Paul says about his own books. And he has more books in the New Testament than anybody else. All right, now, what do you want me to read? And it starts off in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, which he wasn't, because he was not counted amongst the twelve. You understand? He appointed himself an apostle. He was not an apostle. Okay? By the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Jesus. Now, if... Paul says he was appointed an apostle by the will of God. Then why did he say he was called to apostleship by Jesus on the roadside? He said Jesus met him on the roadside and said, Saul, Saul. If he was called by God, then he wasn't called by Jesus. If he was called by Jesus, then he wasn't called by God. Here he says he's called of God because this is his book, remember? So he's writing about himself, but putting somebody else's name on it so people won't know it's him writing about himself. And he says he's called of God. When he was really called by himself. He goes on saying that he got life through Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Another good point for Christians while they're making a point. The point is that in this section, make note that separating God from son. You follow that? Saying from God the Father, and that's a definite article. And then it says, and Christ, which is the word for Messiah, Jesus, our Lord. Word Lord means Rabbi, or Rabboni, or Lord. 
our Lord. So here this person is separating Jesus already from the Godhead. Is that understood? Okay. To these Christians, while they're asking us things to ask, they really put their own foot in their own mouth because they don't know their own scriptures. <laughs> they be just talking. Okay, let's go to three. I thank God whom I serve from my what? Forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Now who is Paul saying he prayed to here? The Lord Jesus Christ or is he praying to God here? To According the, to him. To the creator. That's right. Now, is there any mediator between God and man? Turn to Matthew 9.17. Jesus was called a man, son of man. Matthew, let's see what it says. 9.17. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Man doesn't have the power to do it. Now watch what Paul says, right, in Galatians 3.20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Again, the revelations, or the communication, is coming between man and God, according to Paul himself. And here, in the same book of Timothy, Paul is thanking God who he has separated from Jesus. Yet Christians are always thanking Jesus without the Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I marry. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I do this. Go ahead. Greatly desire to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I might be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfringed faith that is in thee, which dwell first in, my, in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He's not doing it but writing a letter to a person. Right. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So far everything is fine. He's still identifying everything with the heavenly Father. Go ahead. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Now watch what he does here. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Go ahead but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, Jesus came to abolish death in Timothy, and Jesus died on the cross for you in Matthew. Now, <laughs> if Jesus came to eliminate death, then why did he have to die? And they'll say that Jesus died for your sins, right? No. And the Bible doesn't say Jesus died for your sins. Go ahead. Well, unto you I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, and faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which <clears throat> that good thing which was committed unto the keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, <clears throat> of whom are Polyus and Hermogius Herm Hermogius. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my ch chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Esos. Thou knowest very well. Nothing here other than a letter being written by Paul, right, in reference to his son, Timothy, to be passed amongst the Romans where the book was revealed. Nothing. What is there to see in it? And if you look at it, this is called a second epistle. The word epistle means letter. This is another but a letter, not a revelation, not a scripture. 
no specific information in it about anything. There's just one guy writing a letter to somebody else. And they've stuck it in the scriptures as if it's a holy scripture. When you can see it's not directed, it's not from the Heavenly Father. Nothing in it says the Heavenly Father told me to say this. Nothing in it says we have been commanded to do this. This is a person writing a personal letter, which they then stuck in the Bible to make it fat. Just to make it thicker. So what is the question that they're trying to reach at when they gave it to you? Uh, he was trying to tell me about, um, like, the things that's happening today. So he's trying to say that this book has something to do with today? Yeah. He, no, it doesn't. It's looking, it is nothing. There's a letter written in the year 65. Like verse 6? Go ahead. Verse 6. For of, oh, this, go ahead. for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust. Go ahead. But he goes right down in 7 and 8 to tell you what he's talking about. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds retrograde concerning the faith. He's talking about people back in his time, because he said, now these, now these, talking about right there, just as certain people resisted Moses in his time, now these people are resisting Jesus today. Not today in 1988, but today back in the year, way back in the year 65. But it has nothing to do with today, whatsoever. Okay, shukran. See, you got to be careful what Christians try to do, because they have no facts. They try to take portion out of the Bible and make it sound like the day without any history. They don't even know when the book was revealed, why it was revealed, where the man was at. They have no knowledge of what's going on around them. And they try to elaborate on stuff and it leaves people very, very confused and mixed up. And that's what the Christians have been doing since the beginning of time. You got to probe into these people and ask them, you know, try to get inside and ask them what are they teaching, when did it happen, who was it revealed to, what was the situation under the revelation, in other words, when was all this stuff happening? And for what reason? That's the main thing. When you get that word of pistols, you're just talking about some guys writing letters back and forth to each other. Right? Now you ask, the first question should be, who was the letter addressed to? Correct? The answer is to Timothy. And that's cleared up in chapter 1, verse 2. Why did he send this letter? He had to encourage certain people to remembrance of the scriptures. And that was in chapter 1, verse 3. Understand what I'm trying to say? It tells you right inside the scripture who they're talking to and why they revealed it. Y'all got to question these people because these people just be making stuff up. They don't know what to do with themselves. They've never had a doctrine like ours come out against them. They're used to people just accepting that fiction. They haven't had people to sit down and listen. Turn to um, St. John's chapter 18 verse 37. So it can tell us why Jesus came. Because the Christians say Jesus came into the world to die for their sins. Right? Um, According to the scripture, Corinthians says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but here you're going to find out in John, which was one of the only authentic books in the New Testament, other than the book of Revelations, because it's written by the same person. Read what he says. 1837? Yes. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. Now listen. According to them, this is Jesus now. According to them. To this end was I born. This is the reason why I was born. And for this cause came I into the world. This is the reason why I came into the world. That I should bear witness unto the truth. That he should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now why did Jesus come into the world? Why was Jesus born according to the scripture? To die for somebody's sins or to bear witness to the truth? Bear witness to the truth. So where they get this stuff that Jesus was born in the world to die for their sins? They made it up. It's not in the scripture. These are things they make up. It tells you right here why Jesus came into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Now what they do in the book of St. John's chapter 1, go to it. And this was revealed in the Euphrates. In the beginning was the word. Now this guy, we're safe with. If you hold where you're at, have someone turn to Mark 1.19 to find out if we can trust this John. If he was indeed a disciple of Jesus or not. And when he had gone a little further, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. Now, Jesus confirms that James and John are two of his disciples that was with him. 
All right? Mm -hmm. That's important because you won't find that about Paul. So now let's see what it says about that, why Jesus came into the world. Because it tells us he came in the world in St. John chapter 18, verse 37, to bear witness of the truth. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wal haq min Allah. That's what he came for. Now it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. They say that was Jesus. All things was made by him, and without him there was not anything made that was made. In him was the life, higher, and the life was the light, nor in man. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was? John. Now what book do we read the other part in? in John, in John. 1837. Okay, what did he do? The same came as a? Witness. To bear? Witness of the light. That? All men through him might believe. The light is the truth. Correct? No. So now what is he talking about in 1837? Jesus said he came into the world to what? Bear witness of the truth. That I should bear witness unto the truth. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. John wasn't the light, he wasn't the truth himself, but sent to bear witness to the truth. That was the true light, which, which lighteth every man that cometh into the Jesus world. Jesus came into the world, so that light had to light him too. That's the period. See, Christians don't see that. That's the end of that story. Now we're going to talk about somebody totally different. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. His own was the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the tribe of Judah, not the whole world. Go ahead. But as many as received him, to, what them, did he do? to them gave he power to become the sons of Allah, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but now, of Allah. If you want to find out who his own people is, turn to Matthew 12, 29, just to make sure. Because when we get further down, he's going to speak about Moses. The Lord came to Moses, but grace and truth came to Jesus. And the part where they put in there, and he beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, which is in the 14th verse of John, when they have it in brackets, which means it wasn't originally in the scriptures. That's what brackets mean. Go ahead. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel. The sustainer, our creator, or the Lord thy God is, is one. One God. Simple. Where did they get all this other stuff from? He's talking to who here? Children of Israel. He ain't talking to Gentiles. He ain't talking to some reverend in uh, Queens or Jersey or the Bronx. He's talking to the children of Israel because he said, I came to my own. Right there in St. John's chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, they say, see, that means everybody. No, no, no. If I say, I went into my house to talk to my family to try to convince them to do a certain thing, and they didn't, but the ones who did is with me, that means the ones inside that house, not everybody. He said, but as many as did, what? Gave Receive him. Power. That Come means of the children of Israel, because his disciples were from the tribes of Israel. The ones that did accept him. And if you read St. John's chapter 17, the whole chapter, he'll explain that whole story about his disciples. But here we go on. To them he gave power to become the sons of Allah, even to those who just believed on his name. Simple. He gave them power to become the sons of Allah, even if they just believed on his name. Who else has the power to become the sons of Allah? Matthew 5, 9 tells you one. Matthew 5, 45 tells you another. Luke 3, 38. John 1, 12, of course, which we just read. Exodus 4, 22, Psalms 2, 7, Psalms 82, 6, Psalms 89, 27. And you can just read on. He has sons and daughters. 2 Corinthians, turn to Paul, let's see if he says it. 2 Corinthians 6, 18. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So even Paul believed that everybody was the sons of God. And every woman is a daughter of God. Paul believed it. It's nothing new? Okay. I don't understand what they're speaking in tongues. Could you explain? Well, let's go to the Bible. Let's see what they say it is. In Corinthians. This is Paul again, of course. The guy Paul really gets around, doesn't he? 
It should be in First uh, Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye are Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Now first of all, concerning this here incident, who is Paul talking to? Is he talking to Jesus' disciples here, or is he talking to Gentiles? Gentiles. Gentiles. Now step one, let's get that in our mind, because when he starts speaking about tongues, we'll know who he's talking about. Again, I repeat, Christians have a tendency to jump down in the scriptures before they know who they're talking to. You follow? Go ahead. Now we know they're not talking to the disciples, but go ahead. Wherefore, I give you, I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God called, called Jesus accursed. And that no man, that no man can say that Jesus Christ is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now this is Paul saying the only thing that made Jesus the Lord is the Holy Ghost. Of course we know that's not true. The Father said that he'd be Lord of Lords, right? Right. Okay, go ahead. Now there are diversities of gifts. Now he's going to speak about different gifts that come from the Spirit. But the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is all the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit... Now it's going to tell you different spirits that different men have, different types of gifts from the Spirit. One of them is... One is given by the Spirit a word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of, sp discerning of spirits, and to another different kinds of tongues. The word diverse means different kinds of tongues, different languages. Certain men are gifted with the ability to speak different languages, not to go jumba 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 hubba 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 and then some preacher interpret it. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says that one of the gifts of the Spirit is the ability to speak in diverse tongues. They usually put that in italic. They usually circle it out or something. So people could see that. The men of old church knew that these people were perverting the meaning of this. So they pointed it out. Different kinds of tongues to another what? Interpretation of tongues. Another person is given the power to interpret tongues, to translate different tongues. When they speak of tongues, they're speaking about languages here. Certain people are gifted with the ability to speak Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, Spanish, French. People, some people have those gifts and some can interpret, translate. There are men who can speak the Arabic language but they cannot translate. They can read off the Bible but they can't interpret the Hebrew. They don't know what it means. So he's speaking about tongues as a gift from the Spirit that affects different people different ways. It has nothing to do with, and I repeat, I said this to you before, it has nothing to do with no spirit snatching your grandmother out in no chair in church and throwing her on the floor and have her go mumbo jumbo. The Holy Spirit, which is a good spirit, is not going to throw no 60 year old woman on the floor. He doesn't have to do that. He said he'll put his words in your mouth and you would speak, right? right. This ain't about snatching you out the chair and breaking your tambourine and throwing you on the floor and having you foam out the mouth. The funny thing about it is the spirits only visit during the course of the mass. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> they come to church, no spirit. They sit down, no spirit. They rev up, do a little singing, a little tambourine smacking. Usually it's next to somebody who's frightened to death anyway. Someone jumps up, slaps them in the face, falls on the ground. And the reverend runs over there. They stand around and do it all right. And then it's time to go home. They go, Hup! everybody drops it, dusts their clothes off, get in the car and go home. <laughs> the spirit leaves. What did Jesus say about that spirit in John? The spirit, when he said that spirit alights on him and will stay with him for forever. Ever, John says. That means the person would stay in a state of shock. Otherwise, get to the point. Which part is receiving the Spirit? Does it mean the actual shock that knocks you out the seat? Or after the shock has knocked you out the seat that you have good feelings about life? And if that's so, why would you necessarily be knocked out of the seat? You could just been sitting there and got this good feeling about life. What part did Jesus mean would stay with you forever? Because then what happens when a sister in church gets the same thing twice? The following week she gets another Spirit? And then Three months later, she gets another one. Jesus said, when that spirit of lights on you, it will remain with you 
forever. It don't be visiting and leaving. They made all that stuff up. The tongues in the Bible, as we just read, tells you it's different languages, diverse tongues, different languages. And that's because Jesus spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, certain other Phoenician, Philistine, the Galilean language. Uh, he spoke the Nazarite dialect. He spoke many different verses and was teaching people different ways. And that's why the Bible has so many different words in it. Sometimes it has Aramaic. When they use Eli, Eli, that's Aramaic. Right? And other times it uses Rabboni, and that's Hebrew. And other time, you know, there's many different languages being used throughout the scripture, dialects of the ancient language. And of course, Allah, Arabic, is always in here. Okay? We now have available another 24 hours of True Light tapes by popular demand. Our master teacher and spiritual guide, as Sayyid Al-Imam Isa Al-Hadi Al-Mahdi, has for your listening pleasure and enlightenment a total of 48 hours of True Light tapes, answering all those questions scholars and professors can only get to answer, covering such topics as, why use the books of the New Testament? Is the last name Jehovah? The 200 fallen angels? Which Jesus do you follow? And much, much more. Ask your local Ansar representatives, the brothers dressed in white, for copies of the True Light tapes, numbers 1 through 48. If there are no Ansar representatives in your area, call or visit the original tents of Kidar, 717 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. Also, ask or write for a listing of the most dynamic books in history, authored by Sayyid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. And now, let us return to our broadcast. In the four Gospels, it is recorded that Jesus spoke of his death and how he would raise the third day. Since he wasn't crucified, could you explain what he meant by that? Yes, quite simple. In Matthew 24, he also said that when that happens, the temple would fall. As you look in the first book of Matthew 24, and you read that when he speaks about his death and resurrection, he likens it to the temple of Jerusalem and saying that that temple would fall and there would not be left one stone on temple. However, the year 33 of the Christian calendar, the temple of Jerusalem was still standing. The point I'm trying to make is it's very easy for the four Gospels who were storytellers of incidents about Jesus to believe anything they want. Because remember, up until the day after, the so-called crucifixion, they still didn't know what happened to Jesus because they ran. They wasn't there at the cross. Only Mary and them was at the cross. And Mary was the one who tried to tell them that she saw Jesus at the garden and he was still alive. And they didn't want to believe her. Correct? What we got to realize is that the book of the New Testament, that is the Lord Jesus' book, is the book of Revelations, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We often use them in our books just to show people how they contradict themselves. People always ask me if they're wrong, why do you use them? We use them to show you how they contradict themselves. The only book that's called the Injil of Jesus is the last book, the Revelation. That is his book and it says in the beginning of the book that this is his book. Every one of those Gospels we mentioned are according to the writer, correct? And now, like I said before, Matthews, according to them, is supposed to be according to Matthews, right? Let's go to Matthew 9. And let's read the 9 verse of Matthew 9 and see what happens. <clears throat> and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the, at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now this statement is supposed to be in the book of Matthew, correct? Shouldn't yes. this be reading? And as Jesus passed forth, from thence, he saw me, my name is Matthew, sitting at the receipt desk. This is another man talking about Matthews. Now the Christian is going to have to tell us who wrote this book of Matthews, because it definitely wasn't Matthews. You follow what I'm saying? Because yeah. he's not talking about himself. And that will happen in a lot of books. Let's take Luke number one. Let's watch what Luke does here. Luke is going to decide, I'm going to tell you what he's going to do. He's going to decide to write the book only because other people are writing it, not because he's divinely inspired. Read Luke number one. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. 
even even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theopius was... Okay, <laughs> the point is, in is, number three, what did he just say? Did he say that God inspired him to write this, or that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this? No, you know what he just said? It seemed good to me also, being everybody else is writing, being I got all this knowledge that I should write too. Now here's two of these books that we're basing our whole lives on. One man, they say, is Matthew, and it wasn't him writing, and the other man, Luke, just decided to write it himself. Now Mark is going to tell you everything I wrote, Mark chapter 1, I wrote from the Holy Spirit from the Scriptures of old. Let's go to Mark 1. In the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it was written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face. Point is, as it was written, written in the prophets, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, if this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, why do they call it the gospel according to Mark? <laughs> and if this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, why isn't this where the book Matthews is at? Matthews is the first book. They should have this. It should be Mark, Matthews, Luke, John. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is, the lies are over. We're here now to tell people that we got the truth. We want to know which book is Jesus's. Open the book of Revelations. They're no longer going to fool us no more. Deen of Islam is here, the truth, and we're going to shake their walls. What did Jesus say in Revelations chapter 1? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Of who? Of Jesus Christ. Which came from where? Which God gave unto him. Now, that's Jesus's book. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him. Not Mark, not Luke, not Matthew, and definitely not that insane Paul who was ego tripping, who's the one who's responsible for all of the poison that's been spread about the Lord Jesus. And when I say the Lord Jesus, Rabbi is what he referred to himself as. Rabbi means Lord or Rabboni or Master. He was a master, a teacher, and a rabbi. Not God. Okay? So it's very difficult for us to take the accounts of four books. One of the books is a guy who said, everybody else was writing books, so shucks, I guess I'd write one too. I know as much as they did. Another guy is saying, I wrote the book, and in the book someone says, and I just saw Gladys walk by, and Gladys is saying, I'm the one who wrote the book. <laughs> and this guy's obviously lying. I ain't got to tell you about a book I wrote called Contradictions of the Disciples, how many other mistakes is in there. They don't even know, they got the, the names above the cross wrong. They don't know whether it was Jesus the Messiah, rule of the Jews, or Jesus of Nazareth. They don't know. These people were sleeping most of the time. You know that? When Jesus was in the garden praying, his disciples were asleep. They were hiding. The next day, they said they were in the upper room the next day after the so-called crucifixion. And they point out to say, with the door shut. Now, if they loved Jesus and knew him as the Son of God, they should have been willing to die with him. If I have my hands on God in the flesh, if he die, I'm going with him. I'd be nailed up on the cross next to him. I wouldn't be denying and running and hiding. Those fools denied him when they asked him, what, uh, wasn't you one of his followers? I, 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 I don't even know the man, they said. And did they say, I don't even know the Messiah, or I did not know the Son of God? They said, I don't know the man. They dropped him all the way back down to the beginning. Now, if Jesus was with you, let's be for real. Let's me and you be practical between us, all right? Like they say, let's reason together. And all the miracles that you saw, that there's written in this book that Jesus performed, right? If you were there to see and witness these things, raise Lazarus from the dead, heal lepers, make the blind see, the deaf hear, cast out demons, open up heaven, walk into heaven, two dead prophets, one dead for 4,000 and one dead 2,000, namely Elijah and Moses appeared to him while you watched him. And then some men come to kill him. Would you let go of his garment? No. I'd be ready to die with him. I would not let him get away because I don't know what would happen when I'm left behind. I would go with him. You can tell by the story when it comes down to the final hour that those people did not believe Jesus was the Son of God. They did not believe he had power over heaven and hell. They did not believe he had the power to come back. Otherwise, Thomas would not have doubted it. If Jesus taught them, why did Thomas tell him? If they believed in the resurrection of Jesus, that he was going to come back, how come they didn't believe him when he came back? He walked in the upper room. They got scared, the Bible said. It's not like angels were not coming or spirits were not coming before. Angel came to Mary and scared her. Angel came to Elizabeth and scared her. 
It wasn't like they were not used to spirits, but he said, I am not a spirit. Touch me and see that I am not a spirit. I'm a man. Give me some meat, he said. He mean tell me Jesus resided in heaven for three days. The first thing he could think about is coming back in and eating a dead carcass. Let's be for real. The only thing he could think about is some flesh. He's God and he's eating the animals he created. Somebody told a big, big, no, here's what they call it. They called it the greatest story ever told. And that's exactly what it was. The greatest story ever told. But the army Elijah Muhammad loosened the knot and I am untying it. And they'll never bring us down again. Okay? Yes. The peace and blessings of the Most High God be with you. I was in Washington Square Park yesterday and a man came up to me and said the six-pointed star is symbolic of Upper and Lower Egypt. And at David being crowned king of Israel, Melchizedek brought the star to David as a gift. And in that day did it become the star of David. My question is, is this true? And what do the star of David mean to this movement or your organization? Let me address that if I can. Surely. Firstly and foremost, people have a tendency to do a very bad thing, not you. That is to make statements from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without backing up our scripture. And I've been teaching y'all for years. Whenever someone comes up and says, this incident happened, and it uses biblical names, uses scriptural names, you follow? Or Allah's name, or Elohim, or Yahweh, or whatever, ask them, like the Quran says, show and prove it. Show me somewhere in the Torah, in the five books of Moshe or Musa, alayhi salam, show me somewhere where this Moses wrote this here incident in them five books, where Melchizedek came to David when he was being anointed king and gave him the star. They won't find it. People just like to make things up. It is our problem, because as years go on, whoever this fellow is who's going around, he's instituting his thought probably on an authoritative state, as if he knows what he's talking about. And the young may believe him. And then they go on and they say something, you know, like, and this has happened in history, like the six-pointed star represents up in Lower Egypt. When you combine two pyramids together, you can give it a billion different meanings. <laughs> you know, or two circles together, you can say one is the inner world, and one, you can just go all anywhere. But when it comes down to showing and proving it, you follow? Now, the depth of the symbol of the seal of the ever-living and they use the word God, which is the wrong word to use, because we're not Germans, so we shouldn't use the word God, we should use the word Allah. But for speaking to people who have been influenced by that language, we'll use it, okay? In the scriptures, they give a total description of the symbol of the six-pointed star and crescent. It tells you in the books of Revelations about a woman, number 12 that is, yeah. they explain, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Alright? A wonder appeared in heaven. This is John, who's receiving this on the Isles of Patmos, while incarcerated in the year 96, 96 years after the birth of Isa al-Masih, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he's telling him about something he sees. He says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Alright? And the moon, or the crescent, is what they would have in the scripture, Hilal. The crescent was under her feet. Okay? And upon her head was a crown of twelve stars. Now, being we're talking to an Israelite scripture, because they're supposed to be describing the mother of Asa, which is Miriam, Mary, and they followed the ancient Judea teachings, then the star that they say crowned her would have to have been, as you call it, Mogan Devat, the star of David, the six-pointed star. Okay? So when we look in this first and second verse, we're actually seeing mention of a woman with a crescent and 12 stars, which symbolize a six-pointed star. In this instance, they're talking about 12 tribes. Okay, then later on we'll explain that in the scripture, that out of her came the twelve tribes because Jesus was supposed to be of the line of Judah, which is also another mistake they made because they said that he would come out of Judah, yet he came out of the Holy Spirit. So we can go into that at another time. So in this section here, they actually identify 
the crescent and the star of David as being together. And this is after all of Israel fell out of grace. And after the Messiah was supposed to have come, because we're way down to the 12th chapter, the next thing that happens after that is the Antichrist. That's the 13th chapter of Revelation. The next thing to come after this statement about the gathering is the Antichrist. And this is a description. And what's interesting about this is that this description in the book of Revelation here about the birth of Asa and Maryam does not match the book of Matthews. You see, Matthews gives his idea of how Jesus was born and how he was in a manger. Yet when you read the book of Revelations, the description of how Jesus is born here matches the Holy Quran to the letter. That she took off to an eastern place under a tree and did conceive, and Allah provided for her. The Quran explains it that way. Revelation, because this is the only book in the New Testament that is really Isa and Maryam's book. The Injil is really the book of Revelations. All the other books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are books according to, like it says, the Gospel of Luke according to Luke. These are not holy scriptures. These are hadiths. You understand the difference? The only book of the New Testament that was attributed to Isa and Maryam was the book of Revelations. That's called al Injil in the Quran, the Evangel, the words of an angel. Okay? So when you find the story in Revelation matches the Holy Quran, you see the likeness between the two, the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet Isa and Maryam, who Jesus called as his comforter would come after him. So our symbol is here. We use the symbol because it's called in the scripture the seal of the ever living, and it is a combination of all the sons that came out of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, which came out of the Prophet Abraham because our conflict in our family started after Abraham when Abraham or Ibrahim's two sons Ishaq right, and Ismail were separated and Ismail went to Paran, Beersheba which became known as Mecca and his mother Hajar, an Egyptian picked another Egyptian wife and through that seed Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam came and the other son Isaac had twins one called Yaqub and the other called Esau or Ansh, Jacob and Esau and Esau became the father of the Edomite which means Edom means red race and Jacob wrestled with an angel and had his name changed to Israel to ascend into heaven or to verse heaven and became the father of twelve sons and one daughter which became known as the Israelites of which Jesus came from. You see, so when you raise the six-pointed star and crescent you're going over the ignorance before the covenant. You're going back to the initial covenant which were two covenants, promise and flesh in Genesis with Abraham's seed. When you wear the six point of star and crescent, you're saying, I recognize myself as Abraham's seed, being an heir to both the covenants. I am Israel and I am Ishmael. I am both sons. It's the same family. You're going beyond the ignorance of the white man and how he made us think that there was a difference in the family. And the Quran supports that constantly, especially in the second chapter 130, when it tells Muslims anyone who forsakes the Millah of Ibrahim makes a fool of himself. The Quran constantly tells Muslims to follow the religion of Abraham, but along came demons in the form of humans and has Muslims following the religion of Muhammad. They made up a new religion and they based it on the Hadith and they left the Quran. The same way the children of Israel came up with a new religion called Judaism and they based it on the Talmud and the Mishnah and left the five books of Moses. You see what I'm saying? And the same thing happened with Jesus, the Messiah, who was also following Hebraic teaching the religion. He said, I am of Abraham. He told them that. If you knew Abraham, you would know I was coming. Right? And they left his teachings and formed a new religion, Pentecostal or Protestants or Episcopalians, by leaving the teachings of Jesus and starting to read the books or hadith of his companions. You see what I'm saying? So the symbol, six pointed star and crescent, really means that you recognize that the original covenants that the Heavenly Father, Elohim, or Allah Ar-Rahim, made with man through Ibrahim, 
who became the Imam of all the Muslims and who named us Muslims, be you so-called Israelite or so-called Ishmaelite, both of you are Muslims, for what the word Muslim means, one who is of peace. And all of Jesus' followers are Muslims because he said, Bless are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, as translated put it. You see what I'm saying? So the symbol really represents the prophet Abraham's covenants. The crescent is one covenant, and the star is another covenant. The six points represent the six prophets, major prophets, that came before Muhammad. And if you start with them, you see for Israel they're one, and for Ishmael is another. The first is whom? Adam. Correct? The next one we know as Nuh, or as Noah, right? The next one, the, the third one is whom? Abraham, correct? The fourth one, if it's Israel, it's Isaac, and if it's Ishmael, it's Ishmael, okay? So one side of the family uses Ishmael for that fourth representative, and the other side uses where the split came in. So it's Ishmael in this case. And then after Ishmael, we come to the fifth prophet, who is who? Moses. Correct? That's the next time. And finally, the sixth prophet of the house of Israel, Jesus. Correct? And of course, that ends the six points on the star, because that's the covenant that was made with them. Now, the next one is the crescent, because the woman is standing in the crescent. The foundation is in the crescent, in Abraham. You see that? And that crescent in the bottom symbolizes Muhammad, which is the prophet that would come as a comforter, full of the Holy Spirit, after Jesus, alayhi salatu wasalam. So our symbol symbolizes the family of Abraham us coming together again. Whether we call ourselves Israelite Hebrews, or Hebrew Israelites, or black Jews, or we call ourselves Sunni, or Shia, or Ahmadi, or Wahhabi, or Baha'i, we are Abraham's seed, the black seed, the pure seed. And we've got to come together. Okay? I hope I helped you. Now, my question is, if the, um, all right, if the Israelites were to separate themselves from the Canaanites, is that true? That they were commanded to do that, yes. Okay. Now, my, my question is, why was Simon, I'm talking about not Simon that later became Peter, but Simon the, the Canaanite. Canaanite, yes. Why, why was he amongst the disciples? Because he was from the province called Canaan. He was not a Canaanite. All of Jesus' disciples were indeed uh, Israelites of different tribes of Israel. But he was from, you see that, Canaan, so he was called a Canaanite. The way Jesus was called a Nazarite, even though he was from the tribe of Judah, he wasn't a Nazarite. But they call him Jesus of Nazareth. But that canon was not a Canaanite, but a portion of Jerusalem had fallen to the Canaanites centuries before, back in Moses' time, which we find in the books of Leviticus, chapter 14 and 13, where they say, when you go into the land of Canaan, I'll give you for a possession. That was the land of Jerusalem. So he was living in the land of Canaan. None of Jesus' disciples were Canaanites. In fact, in the book of Matthew, Jesus wouldn't even heal a Canaanite woman. He wouldn't touch her. Her faith is what healed her in Matthew 15. 15 is 22. Let's see what happens here. The Messiah does this. And Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Thai and Sidon. Now, Thai and Sidon are both tribes of Amorites of the 11 sons of the cursed seed of Canaan. All right? Mm -hmm. Sidon was one of those 11 sons. So that place where Jesus is going is one of those cities that was ruled by Amorites. All right? Which were the cursed seed according to the Bible. All right? Now, here's what happens. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. A woman from the tribe of Canaan came out of Sidon. Sidon, again, was the white people in the Bible. That was 11 sons, which I can show you the complexion and everything, which I'm quite sure you already know. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. In this sense, what they have done in their Greek and their Latin, is they've taken away the word Esayid, which means master, and they've given the impression by this capital L that they had the word Rabb, which means sustainer, which is falsely translated as Lord. See, sometimes the Messiah, Isa, is referred to in the scripture as Esayid, when people are trying to be disrespectful to him, and other times people who respected him call him Rabboni, which was another way of saying rabbi or master. 
in the ancient language. In this case, what they did is they played a word game on people in the translation. They didn't point out that this word is Sayyid. So she was not really being respectable. She was not approaching him as if he was a rabbi. She was approaching him like Mr. In English, the word Mr. means master. You follow? So first of all, when she said, have mercy on me, O Lord, she was saying, have mercy on me, Mr. A Sayyid is in the language. Thou son of David. She didn't call him the son of God. She identified him with his lineage as a mortal. She was not being respectful. All right? Now watch. Then she says, my daughter is vexed with a devil. My daughter is possessed, is what she's saying, with a devil. She knew that the Messiah had the power to cast out demons. Her daughter was a devil who was now acting like a devil. Possessed as you would have it. Possessed of evil spirits. She needed an exorcist. So this woman came to Jesus for him to exorcise this devil as it have it. Mm -hmm. But he, meaning Jesus, answered her not a word. Period. Jesus ignored the woman. The woman spoke to him and he did not even respond. And there's a period there. All right, now watch. And his disciples came. That means they wasn't there at first. And besought him. They was looking for Jesus. Saying, what did his disciples tell him to do to her? Send her away. For she cries after us. They told Jesus to send this woman away. Don't heal her. Don't help her. Because she came to us first. And what? But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His answer was, he was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He wasn't sent to Gentiles. Paul fabricated that whole teaching. Paul is the father of Christianity, not Jesus. Christians quote Paul. They don't quote Christ. Everything Paul said, Paul said, Paul said, Paul said. Jesus was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only, which is the tribe of Judah.